Between every two pines is a doorway to a new world. A world with tools nearly forgotten in the forests we've hunted and hiked since the beginning of man. The Susquehannock tribes used hemlock trees to stop bleeding, while today we use the mushrooms growing from these same trees in cancer research. The magic of these forests is disappearing, one species at a time. The trees you fell and the logs you drive make pulp for paper to blueprint the dreams that put a hundred thousand men to work on a new model and a new job. America has changed. So it is that we can make our living on a farm and have a home in town. So it is that we can live where we want to. The shopping centers now come out to meet us. Any natural lack or artificial shortage may stop the entire economic parade. Uh, right now we're in um, Dillsburg, Pennsylvania along the uh, Semino triloba leaves, the pawpaws. Um, reminiscing about the Ganoderma suge of the spring. Um, Ganoderma suge is a very unique uh, mushroom. It falls under a class we call reishi. It's a very good uh, medicinal mushroom that's been sought for for thousands of years. Kind of reminds me of my ties to mushroom foraging, even as a child hunting these exact woods for morels, the morcella mushrooms, ever since I was a little kid. You know, it's something that sticks with us through life. And these mushrooms have stuck with us through the human existence. The Ganoderma suge, a local reishi mushroom, local to Pennsylvania. You can find it in New York, Maryland, um, I believe it all the way down into Virginia. Anywhere with that really dense uh, hemlock. Unfortunately, hemlock trees in this area specifically are seeing a lot of disease and issues. That's why we're finding more and more of the Ganoderma suge reclaiming that nutrients and returning that tree to the ground. Keep it matching, you know? Whenever we're uh, foraging for Ganoderma suge, um, really we're looking for that old growth forest. Uh, suge, or hemlock trees, are known as old lock or old growth areas. Um, we're looking for areas that haven't been logged off areas that are kind of void of human interaction. Um, these usually are pretty deep in state forests. Uh, we really like ridgy areas. Typically suge or Ganoderma suge uh, or a correlation of the two will grow along creek banks um, because of that extra moisture creating a microclimate that we'll see. Um, during rainy seasons you will be able to find them a little bit further off the creeks when that moisture is a little more prevalent through the woods but still only on the Ganoderma suge, or on the suge trees, hemlock trees, hence why they get their name. So regardless of where you look, what time of year, if you're not looking at a hemlock tree, you're not looking in the right spots. Which one, should I cut it at the same spot back there? Like the way that it comes off the tree and it's little numb, it's shiny. Love it.
The eastern hemlock, Tsuga cadensis, is the state tree here in Pennsylvania. It was recommended as a state tree in the late 1800s, and I believe that it became the state tree in the early 1900s. This tree came more into prominence as the decline of the buffalo migrating through Pennsylvania happened after the colonization of the Europeans. As the buffalo migrated through the state, uh, the carbon was cycled more through plain lands and through uh, buffalo grazing. The hemlock has defi definitely come more prominent in these ecosystems as a carbon bank, storing large amounts of carbon for uh, extended periods of time and also serving as a keystone species. So uh, Pennsylvania, we're known as the Keystone State, and we would look at hemlock as a keystone species. If you're building an arch, um, the stone that's in the top middle part of the arch is often referred to as the keystone. It's a special looking stone and, it, and that stone being there supports the entire weight of the structure. So without that stone, the structure would collapse, the arch would collapse. So uh, we call certain species keystone species like uh, the wolves in Yellowstone Park. Um, once they were removed from the environment, the elk population came out of control. Uh, they consumed too much of the willow trees and the reduction of the willow trees uh, led to stream erosion. Um, so the entire landscape started to uh, degrade uh, with the removal of that keystone species being the, uh, the, the wolf there in Yellowstone. So uh, we think of the hemlock as a keystone species here in Pennsylvania as it is the host to over 120 different species from animals uh, to other plants and fungi. Um, so, you know, as a mycologist here in Pennsylvania, we look um, to the hemlock forest, particularly for the hemlock reishi being the most stand out uh, growing off of the hemlock tree, the Ganoder Matsuge, uh, which grows in association and we're seeing an abundance um, as the hemlock population is dying down due to the effects of the invasive woolly adelgid. Uh, the woolly adelgid is an insect pest pathogen uh, that was introduced into the United States into Virginia um, and has slowly encroached into Pennsylvania and through the Appalachian Range, destroying massive amounts of hemlock population uh, all up and down the Appalachian Range from Maine all the way down into Georgia. Due to the damage from the woolly adelgid, we are seeing a boom in the population of Ganoder Matsuge as it's coming in and eating the trees as they're dying, which, you know, may be unfortunate, maybe some level of ecological process. Um, there's still so much to, to know. Um, luckily, there are some uh, hemlock trees that through Penn State and other universities have found have some level of resistance to the woolly adelgid. And through programs at Penn State, uh, these specimens are being cloned and reintroduced into uh, forests so that we can scale out um, larger hemlock forests with more of a resistant to the woolly adelgid. And why is hemlock looked at with such importance? Why are these students at Penn State working to repopulate whole forests with resistance to this pest? In Pennsylvania, a lot of our forests are deciduous. You know, we'll lose the leaves uh, in the fall. You know, the leaves are starting to change their color and they'll fall off. Um, when the leaves fall off the tree, the sunlight gets direct access to the ground um, where the soil may become dried up, you know, the, the wind will blow through and it can dry up the soil. This is a deterrent to any sensitive organisms that may want to live in the top of the soil or at the base of the trees or anything like that. Um, so in the hemlock forests, we find more sensitive organisms that require um, more of a protected environment in order to complete their life cycle. Um, because the hemlocks don't drop their needles in the wintertime, we have more protection from the sun uh, which allows for more nuanced organisms, different kinds of bryophytes, and interesting fungi like the cordyceps mushrooms. The hemlocks do create such a unique ecosystem. They shade off these beautiful creeks, uh, which allows for trout um, and other, uh, you know, wonderful boreal or wonderful temperate organisms. Rishi is set apart by its medicinal qualities its terpenoids, beta-glucans, and polysaccharides. This is why early Asian cultures would make teas from the fruiting bodies. These same compounds are what we seek through modern day extractions. Studies show reishi contains genus-specific compounds that reduce inflammation. A study combining chemotherapy and reishi regimens together 
had shown symbiotic benefits and minimized chemo-related side effects. Our forests are full of magic. We're connected to it. It's part of us, part of our story. There's a growing part of society that wants healing for the soil. People are finally waking up to the neglect of our own lands and taking action.